This is the story of a strong man with big ideas. Giovanni Belzoni was a circus performer who became the greatest buccaneer in the history of archaeology. He went to Egypt to irrigate the desert, but was attracted by an even greater prize. The methods he used to take away the works of the pharaohs were worthy of the pharaohs themselves. He robbed their graves and unlocked their secrets. And he filled the whole wing of the British Museum. But Belzoni died in obscurity, and somebody else claimed the fame. Giovanni Belzoni was a strong man, the strongest man in London. He stood a massive six foot seven inches. Belzoni was born in Italy in 1778, the son of a barber. As a young man, he was in constant flight from Napoleon Bonaparte's invading armies. They seemed to follow him all through Europe. So it was as a refugee that he came to England in 1802. I am destined to travel. My family were not rich, so I did not choose to be a burden to them. I have visited different parts of Europe and suffered many injustices. I have been wandering ever since. For ten years, he traveled around Britain, playing at local fairs and theaters. He used a variety of stage names. The Italian Hercules, the Patagonian Samson, always the strong man. <laughs> Ten years demonstrating brute strength could make a man financially comfortable, but not necessarily give him peace of mind. And Belzoni was a thinking man. He saw himself not as a circus freak, but as a man of logic. What interested him were the new sciences, optics, electricity, and his real passion, hydraulics. It was hydraulics that inspired his grand cascade of fire and water. But the crowds wanted the massive presence of a strong man, not the invisible hand of an engineer. My inventions fell among the audience like pearls among swine. But I could not halt the course of my obsession with hydraulics. 
If I was to be recognized as a scientist, then it would no longer be in the circus, but in the field of learning. In 1815, Belzoni left England, determined to sell his skills elsewhere. On the Mediterranean island of Malta, he found someone who wanted to buy them. A man looking for engineers and modern technology. A scout for the Pasha of Egypt. He told me of his master's passion for progress. When I explained my hydraulic construction, he suggested I should be practicing my craft upon the banks of the Nile. It was the first time Belzoni had been taken seriously as an engineer. His next stop would be Egypt. Cairo in 1815, like nothing Belzoni had seen before. Western knowledge of Egypt rested on fragments gleaned from the Bible. Little was known about its ancient civilization, and even that was drenched in romanticism. But to Belzoni, the day before his meeting with the Pasha, this was a breathtaking land. I could not restrain myself from going to see the wonder of the world. The scene here is majestic and grand. A mist over the plains of Egypt formed a veil which vanished gradually as the sun rose and unveiled to the view that beautiful land. For 40 centuries, the pyramids at Giza had looked out across the desert. Belzoni, confident that he could work miracles with irrigation, was sure that from now on, they would look down over the garden. Belzoni erected his water wheel in the grounds of the Pasha's palace. My machine was set to work, and although constructed in bad wood by Arabian carpenters, it drew six or seven times more water than the common machines. The wheel was a huge success, in engineering terms, but in political terms, it was a disaster. The Pasha, Muhammad Ali, may have had a craze for modernization, but it was not shared by his court which felt threatened by change. The Italian was dropped, and now living in a boarding house. So much for the Pasha's encouragement of European engineers. They are enticed into his service, but are soon left to bewail their credulity. Belzoni had come to Egypt with a dream of changing its future, but in doing so, he had sacrificed his own. While the great Belzoni was languishing in Cairo, an Englishman arrived who would change the course of his life. Henry Salt, the first British consul to Egypt. Salt was most things that Belzoni wasn't. He was pompous and self-pitying. But like Belzoni, he had ambition. As a young man, he had become an Egyptologist. When Belzoni was in fairgrounds making human pyramids, Henry Salt was studying the real thing. His instructions from the British government were simple. Locate the best antiquities and send them home. Whatever might be the expense of the undertaking, whether successful or otherwise, it would be cheerfully supported by an enlightened nation. In reality, Salt's task was to take on the French. In 1798, Napoleon had sent an invasion force to Egypt, and ever since, his engineers had been recording and removing the great works of the pharaohs. They'd had the field to themselves, but now Salt wanted a piece of the action. 
His first target was Ozymandias, a huge granite head 500 miles from Cairo. To fetch it, he needed a strong man, someone with nothing to lose. On March the 12th, 1815, the destitute Belzoni was invited to the consulate. Their meeting was brief and decisive. I found him in difficulty and despair and afforded him the means of distinguishing himself. I told the consul I would be happy to undertake the removal of the bust without the smallest view of interest, as he told me it was to go to the British Museum. An arrangement was made. Belzoni was given an advance and a list of instructions concerning the bust. Every detail was covered, including the advice not to drop it in the Nile. But a crucial misunderstanding remained. Salt saw Belzoni as a mere hired hand. Belzoni saw himself as something more grand, an explorer. I hired a boat at a very cheap rate. With four sailors and a boy, we set sail on the 30th of June. My curiosity was at a high pitch. It was the first time he had gone south from Cairo. And this was a different, remoter country. He had no idea what to expect. Three days from Cairo, Belzoni got his first sight of the opposition. Salt had referred to the French in passing, but neglected to mention that they were armed and fortified. Along both sides of the Nile Valley, the French engineers had carved out the best territories for their excavations. They saw sites such as Thebes, where Belzoni was destined as their own. It appeared to me like entering a city of ancient giants who after a long conflict were all destroyed, leaving the ruins of their temples as the only proof of their existence. On looking at places of such magnitude and antiquity inhabited by a half savage people makes one strongly feel the difference between ancient and modern Egypt. was lost in the contemplation of so many objects that for a time was unconscious whether I were on terrestrial ground or on some other planet. Following Salt's instructions, Belzoni found the head of Ozymandias in the temple, exactly where the consul said it would be. Near the remains of its body and chair lay the head, with its face turned upwards and apparently smiling at me at the thought of being taken to England. I was not surprised by the size of the object, but its beauty, which was beyond description. But how to move it? Seven and a half tons, five miles to the Nile. The French had tried by placing dynamite in the head to detach it from the torso. Ozymandias had been here for over 4,000 years, as permanent, seemingly, as the desert. The challenge was about to begin. The problem of moving seven tons of granite the five miles to the river had brought out the best in Belzoni the engineer. The local Arab chief had called him mad, Magnum, but agreed to lend him 80 workers. 
But pray, he said smilingly, have you a scarcity of stones in Europe that you come here to fetch them away? I answered that we had plenty of stones, but those of Egypt were of a better sort. Once out of the temple, good progress was made. In the next three weeks, they pulled the head two miles. It was a massive achievement, and Belzoni decided to record the scene for posterity. Like all good stories, it grew somewhat in the telling. The head had expanded, and the workers were all in superb physical shape. Progress was satisfactory, but Belzoni was not yet in the clear. He had now reached the Nile's floodplain, and this was dangerous. If the rains came, the head would have to be abandoned to the swollen river. The pace increased, but so did the temperature. Belzoni's strength began to fail. I never felt the sun so powerful before in my life. Being in the hottest season, the air was in flame, the wind on fire. Belzoni had ophthalmia, sun blindness. The locals took pity and treated him with a medicine based on a recipe of garlic and herbs. But for three weeks, he couldn't see a thing. And all the time, Ozymandias was sitting near the Nile with the rainy season approaching. When Belzoni recovered, he learned that the local chief would no longer release his workers. This called for a drastic solution. I went straight to the Kachev and demanded an explanation. He replied they would sooner starve than undertake a task so arduous as yours. Belzoni solved that one with a bribe. Although he was careful not to hand over any bullets. The workers returned the following day. On the 30th, we continued work, and the Colossus advanced 150 yards toward the Nile. On the 31st, we could not proceed, as the road became so sandy that the Colossus sunk into the ground. Third, we did extremely well and advanced nearly 400 yards. On the 10th and 11th, we approached the river. And on the 12th, thank God, Ozymandias arrived on the bank of the Nile. It was a spectacular triumph. As soon as the head was safely on the boat, Belzoni sent a message to Salt telling him of his success. To the British consul in Cairo, I am pleased to relate that Ozymandias has begun its journey to England. <laughs> The 
Henry Salt didn't see the granite head pass through Cairo, but others told him of the great sight. He then wrote his report for the London papers, substituting his own name for Belzoni's. By the indefatigable labors of Mr. Salt, the British Museum is to become the richest depository of Egyptian antiquities in the world. Belzoni had no way of knowing what Salt had done. He had proved to be more than a hired hand. And now, at the celebration that followed the removal of the bust, he was being anointed by the very people who a month before had seen only a madman. In Egypt, Belzoni was becoming a legend. Belzoni's phenomenal success with the head of Ozymandias meant that he had a full six months left of his contract with Salt. All the time evading the French, he went further up the Nile on a collecting spree. Everything, he believed, would go to the British Museum. Grab the rope, huh? As his collection increased, so did his curiosity about this ancient land. I could not help but wonder how a nation which was once so great as to erect these stupendous edifices could so far fall into oblivion that even their languages and the writing are totally unknown to us. I do not know that I ever quitted a place with so much regret, but my principal object would not permit me to stay here any longer. Belzoni's principal object was a place called Abu Simbel. He had heard a traveler's tale of a giant stone head poking through the desert sand. This place was another 300 miles south, in the land of Nubia. Belzoni was joined by two English naval officers, James Irby and Charles Mangles. For the past 10 years, they'd been fighting the French on the high seas and had acquired a taste for it. What attracted them to Abu Simbel was less the stone head and more the chance of a desert firefight with the French. The French were increasing their presence and had moved into territory the Belzoni had just excavated. But two weeks later, Belzoni and the naval officers arrived unimpeded in Abu Simbel. Beneath this massive dune, according to Belzoni, they would find a submerged temple. A group of locals was hired to help, but the season was against them. This was now midsummer. For three weeks we labored on the dune. At that time of the year, the heat was intense, and digging in the sand was like trying to make a hole in water. The holy month of Ramadan came, and the Muslims left. Then the heat got the better of Irby and Mangles. And finally, Belzoni gave in. On the 27th of June, we consumed the last of our supplies. I registered the heat at 125 degrees Fahrenheit. 
I became convinced that if I did not find the entrance soon, then the sound would have defeated us. Back in the comfort of the consulate, Salt was waiting for news of Belzoni. I'm sorry to say that Cairo by no means agrees with me. In the months of July and August, it is a perfect furnace. To stagnate thus, at a distance from all science, literature, arts, delicacy and taste, is a punishment almost sufficient to drive one mad. In Abu Simbel, Belzoni had found the solution, water. By dampening the sand, the men were able at last to make a proper impression into the dune. Three more weeks of intense effort followed. They were driven on now by the gathering prospect of unearthing a great temple. At last, on August the 1st, 1817, they found the entrance. It was just a small incision in the rock, but wide enough for a man to scramble through. They had entered the vast palace of Abu Simbel, domain of the great Ramesses II, the first to walk here in over 2,000 years. A circus man in an altogether grander theatre. all this splendor, the great Belzoni became a man of science, carefully recording the dimensions of the glory that surrounded him. By the feet of seven inches. Belzoni, Irby and Mangles made a plan of everything they found One the feet six inches. until forced to leave by the intense heat. The three men signed off in style, carving their own names into the rock. From Abu Simbel, Belzoni returned alone to Thebes. But the situation there had changed dramatically since the summer. The French had moved into the ancient city and intensified their operations. Belzoni returned to see his own stockpile of antiquities smashed up by the French engineers. He was furious and tried to get back to his old excavation. But he was spotted and the cry went up. <laughs> bullet missed. Belzoni now asked Henry Salt for government protection. My dear Belzoni, I do not agree with you in considering this to be a national insult or as having anything to do with my consular character. 
you must be aware that you are not at present engaged in any official employ. It is absolutely necessary that this should be explicitly understood. I am collecting for myself, and you are acting in a private capacity. Salt's reply meant that Belzoni was vulnerable to further attack. So he left the temples of Thebes and headed for the burial grounds on the opposite bank of the Nile. Here, in this vast necropolis, were the Kernesi tribe. For centuries, they had lived among the mummies and tombs of the ancient Egyptians. Belzoni went straight to them and struck an immediate rapport. He was told about treasure within the tombs. Kernesi tomb robbery was not a subtle art. But with Belzoni's homemade battering ram, it could be a very effective one. I succeeded in obtaining admission into any cave where mummies were to be seen. It was truly impossible to give any description of those subterranean abodes and their inhabitants. I could not pass without putting my face in contact with that of some decaying Egyptian, could not avoid being covered with legs, arms, and heads rolling from above. Thus I proceeded from one cave to another, surrounded by bodies, by heaps of mummies in all directions, impressed me with horror. While the tribesmen went in search of gold, Belzoni went in search of papyrus. It was from these records, hidden in the mummies, that scholars would eventually piece together the history and belief system of ancient Egypt. Belzoni was slowly unraveling a mystery. The mystery was most tightly woven in the Valley of the Kings. Here there were meant to be the undisturbed tombs of the pharaohs, but no one knew where. Perhaps the constant observations I made in the Valley of the Kings enabled me to see what other travelers had missed. I often observed travelers who, confident of their own knowledge, let slip opportunities of ascertaining whether or not they were correct in their notions. Belzoni used his engineering skills to squeeze a meaning out of the void. Where did the water go? What made the rocks different? Why was there subsidence? In two weeks, the men shifted enough stone to build themselves a small pyramid. Everywhere they looked, they found small tombs. But Belzoni was no longer interested in the word small, and he drove himself on. On the 16th of October, Belzoni found what he was looking for. It was the chamber of Seti I, pharaoh of the 18th dynasty who had reigned 1,300 years before Christ. 
I perceived immediately by the painting on the ceiling that this was the entrance to a magnificent tomb. At the end of the corridor, we descended ten steps. From this, we entered a small chamber, which I gave the name Room of Beauties, for it is adorned with the most beautiful figures in basso Realievo. Still further, the hall opens into a large vaulted chamber. The ceiling of the vault itself is painted blue with a procession of figures and other groups related to the zodiac. It was here that the body of the king was deposited. How can I describe my sensations at that moment? I seemed alone in the midst of all that is most sacred in the world. While Belzoni studied the tomb in detail, Henry Salt, having heard the great news, was rushing to the Valley of the Kings. He had with him a party of touring English aristocrats, Lord Belmore, his family, and his biographer. Salt immediately gave his friends a guided tour of the tomb, a place he himself was seeing for the first time. The Italian was ignored. If an observation is made to them by anyone who had not the good fortune of having a classical education, they scorned to listen to it, and replied with a smile, if not a laugh. Belzoni felt slighted, especially when Salt referred to him as his man, and the tomb as my discovery. He could feel the glory slipping away. It is all for salt. I find these. If they are not for Belzoni, they are for no one. I finish. Belzoni severed all connections with the consul and returned to Cairo. Once there, he went straight to the British consulate. In the yard, he found his entire collection amassed and ready to be shipped back to England. On every sculpture, the same label, H. Salt. In the consul's study, the picture was even worse. Copies of the European reviews praising the Salt collection. It will be seen that Mr. Salt has been indefatigable in his researches. We rejoice to find that in return he has possessed himself of a rich harvest of long buried treasures. It is through the zeal, personal exertions and great pecuniary liberality of Mr. Salt that many of the hidden treasures of Egypt have come to light. We have few words to add respecting Belzoni. Whose death has been announced in the public print. To Belzoni, this was a betrayal. How to avoid being erased from the record? This was now the question. He decided to unpick the greatest puzzle of all, that of the Pyramid of Chephren, 4,000 years old and believed to be solid. Belzoni had a hunch it was not. 
My eyes were fixed on that enormous mass, which for so many ages has baffled the conjectures of ancient and modern writers. A natural impulsion took me toward the south side of the pyramid. I examined every part and almost every stone. Then I came around to the north. Here, the appearance of things was somewhat different from that of any of the other sides. Having made this clear and simple observation, I found that if there were any chamber at all in the second pyramid, the entrance could not be in the center. But calculating by the passage in the first pyramid, the entrance would be nearer 30 feet to the east. This gave me no little delight, and hope returned to cherish my pyramidical brains. It took him just three weeks to crack the puzzle, and then Belzoni was treading the path of the pharaohs again. I had the pleasure of finding myself in the way of the central chamber of one of the two great pyramids of Egypt. Belzoni had defied 3,000 years and received wisdom and found his way to the core of the pyramid. Once there, he wasted no time. No one would be allowed to forget this achievement. Scoperta da G. Belzoni. Belzoni found it. Soon after making his mark, literally, on the pyramid, Belzoni returned to London. Five years ago, England had known him as a circus strongman. He wanted homage now as a great artist and explorer. The first thing he did was to begin his narrative, a rollicking account of his Egyptian campaign. The priority was to settle scores with Henry Salt. It has been erroneously stated that I was regularly employed by Mr. Salt, the consul of His Britannic Majesty in Egypt, for the purpose of bringing the colossal bust from Thebes. I positively deny that I was ever engaged by him in any shape whatever either by words or writing. To the alarm of Salt, London warmed to this mysterious man licking his wounds in public and thrilled to his tales. Despite Salt's rebuttal, the narrative went into a second, then third edition. And then Belzoni's drawings and sketches were published to further acclaim. But the question on everybody's lips was, who was he? Belzoni's response was to tease the public some more. He decided to unwrap a mummy he had brought back from the Valley of the Kings. His audience were doctors. The last Belzoni public performance had seen him lifting eight men in front of a raucous crowd of chimney sweeps and fishwives. Now, he was before the Royal College of Surgeons. We watched this gigantic man in fascinated silence as he attacked his bundle of rags. And then, imagine our disbelief as a human form, perfectly preserved, emerged from its ancient casing. It 
It was the first mummy that London had ever seen, and it further stoked the public appetite. Now Belzoni's show moved to the Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly. Thousands came to see the artifacts he had brought back from Egypt. The Sekhmets, the Sphinxes, the Papyrus. But the greatest attraction was the man himself, Giovanni Belzoni. The great lion, great in every sense, was the gigantic Belzoni, the handsomest man for a giant I'd ever seen. He seems a man of great simplicity, tells his pains and pleasures with the openness of a child. His story is like a fairy tale. The Duchess of Beaufort. The invitations rolled out and the grandees rolled in. Everybody wanted to be seen with the great explorer. Sir Walter Scott. Thank you for coming. Did I ever see men When the show finally closed, Belzoni was able to look back at a satisfying box office success. But what he really wanted was the recognition of the experts. He approached the British Museum and asked them to buy the Belzoni collection. But the museum was not interested. It already had the greatest of Belzoni's finds, deposited by Henry Salt. And then suddenly it was over. Egyptomania, like all manias, blew itself out. Belzoni was replaced in Piccadilly by the elastic midgets. He was forgotten and snubbed. So to reclaim public attention, he looked again to the continent of Africa. He'd unlocked its past. Now he wanted the key to its heart, the lost city of Timbuktu. In 1822, Belzoni set off on his last quest. He would never return. That year, a young English poet, Shelley, first saw the great bust. His poem, Ozymandias, was a tribute to an ancient civilization and an obituary for the forgotten world. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Giovanni never made it to the heart of Africa. On the 3rd of December, 1823, he died from dysentery in the desert. He was 800 miles from Timbuktu. His greatest discoveries remain inside the British Museum as the Salt Collection. <laughs>